presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Idaho has five distinct ecosystems. What kind of ecosystem you live in tells you a lot about the animals and plants in your area. Do you have questions about Idaho's ecosystems? Well, scientists are standing by with answers. Stay tuned. Science Trek is next. Hi, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen, and welcome to Science Trek. And welcome to the Idaho Museum of Natural History. Scientists are standing by to answer your questions, and later in the show, we'll learn a little bit more about the base of most ecosystems, the soil. But first, let's learn a little bit more about Idaho ecosystems. A habitat is made up of four things that all animals need. Food, water, shelter, and space. When an animal lives in a place that has the right amount of all these things, then it's living in a healthy habitat. Let's take a closer look. Food. Water, shelter, and space. First three are pretty easy to understand, right? You have to eat, drink, and have a place to stay. But what about space? Do you need space? <laughs> we all need space, although some of us require more than others. A spider would only need a small area to build a web, maybe in your backyard. But what about a cougar? It requires a lot more space than a spider, even as much as 120 square miles. This desert has a lot of space, but very little water. In fact, for an area to be considered a desert, it must have less than 10 inches of moisture a year. This affects the kinds of plants that can grow here, which in turn affects the types of animals that can adapt to living in a desert. Plants that have adapted to desert life by altering their physical structure are called xerophytes. They usually have a special way of storing water, like this cactus that collects water in its fat stem. Some other desert shrubs have also adapted by reducing the size of their leaves to eliminate transpiration, which means the loss of water to the air. Desert wildlife is also adapted. Many animals avoid the heat of midday and only become active at dusk and dawn. These animals are said to be crepuscular. A good example of a crepuscular reptile is the rattlesnake. Some desert animals, like this bat, Yikes. go one step farther and only come out in the cool temperatures of the dark night. These are called nocturnal animals. Others live in burrows beneath the soil to escape high temperatures at the desert surface. And above it all soar the birds of prey. They feed on the small mammals when they emerge from the ground. All have adapted to extreme temperatures and very little water. Wetlands, on the other hand, have lots of water for at least part of the year. Water drives the other two things that define a wetland, hydrophytes and hydric soil. Hydro means water. Phytes is the word for plants. Hydrophytes, like this cattail, are plants that have adapted to wet conditions. These don't suffocate or rot in water-soaked or hydric soil. That soil is composed of organic materials, plants that have died and built up without breaking down like they do in drier soils. These soils work like giant sponges, absorbing water during floods. The plants improve water quality by trapping pollutants and soaking up nutrients from animal waste and farm fertilizer. Wetlands provide food, water, shelter, and space for birds like ducks and shorebirds. They're also important stopover places for migrating birds, like these snow geese stopping in Idaho on their way to nesting grounds farther north. Remember our desert habitat? Some of the less obvious wetlands are places like this, the thin green lines that wind through the deserts. This narrow strip of relatively lush vegetation is the lifeblood of Idaho's desert wildlife. Bighorn sheep, frogs, antelopes, songbirds, and other species depend on these critical wetlands to survive. 
forests combine some of the characteristics of wetlands and deserts. Rainforests have lots of water. Other forests are dry. Here in Idaho, the forests of the Panhandle, called boreal forests, are very wet. But the forests in other parts of the state are dry or temperate forests. The tall trees in a forest are called the overstory. The wind spreads their seeds and pollen. The understory, the shrubs and grasses beneath the tall trees, are designed to grow in shade. There's usually less wind in the understory, so these plants have adapted by using animals to disperse their seeds. In a temperate forest, precipitation may fall throughout the year. However, during the winter, moisture is less available because it's frozen. Animals that live in this type of forest must be able to tolerate hot summers and adjust to cold winters by either hibernating, migrating, or keeping active. Hibernation gets black bears through the winter. They fatten up during the warm months on insects and berries, then hibernate when food is scarce. When grasses and shrubs become buried in snow, many animals, like deer and elk, migrate from mountains to lower elevations where food is more available. If a forest animal does not hibernate or migrate, it must stay active to survive the cold. This wolverine remains in the high country but spends the winter feeding on dead animals, often the deer and elk that don't survive the harsh weather. In boreal forests, the summers are wet and cool. Dead plants decompose slowly, creating the same hydric soils that are found in wetlands. Animals like this moose have adapted to this wet, cool climate. In the summer, moose can be found feeding on the aquatic vegetation in ponds and marshes tucked into the forests. During the cold, wet winters, they eat willows and shrubs. Their long legs make it possible for moose to reach the tall branches, and their black coat absorbs the warming rays of the sun. So what is a grassland? Like a forest, grasslands can be either wet or dry. In Idaho, our grasslands are in the north, near Moscow. This area is called the Palouse. It's one of the most endangered ecosystems in the United States. Only 1% remains. This area is rich in volcanic soils, which make good farmland. So when white settlers arrived, the native plants were plowed up to sow wheat. Summers and winters are mild in our grasslands. The rainfall is evenly distributed throughout the year. That means it's just as wet in the summer as the winter. Because of that, the plants don't need the long tap roots desert plants need to reach water. And what are grassland plants? Grasses, of course, plus special wildflowers like camas. Grasslands can be blustery places because there are not many trees to slow the wind. The long, narrow leaves of the grasses helps reduce evaporation by the wind. Wildlife that lives in grasslands often seek shelter in the ground. No trees, right? Animals like pocket gophers, skunks, and red foxes are adapted to burrow into the ground. So if you were a wild animal, where would you live? In a forest, a wetland, desert, or grassland? And joining me now to answer your questions about Idaho ecosystems, are Rosemary Smith, Professor of Biology at Idaho State University, and Leif Tampanella, Director of the Idaho Museum of Natural History. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Okay, let's go to your questions. Hi, my name's Amber and I go to White Pine Elementary and I have a question about ecosystems. What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem is all of the living and non-living organisms that interact with one another in a specific location. There are many kinds of ecosystems and they don't have distinct borders. Hi, my name is Hannah. I go to Dalton Elementary and my question is, does Idaho have more than three ecosystems? Sure, Idaho has way more than three ecosystems. If we think from the top to the bottom, we go from the alpine ecosystem down to forested ecosystems, through the grassland ecosystems, we have desert ecosystems, and then at the very low points, we have our watery riparian ecosystems. Hi, my name is Rebecca, and I go to Galileo STEM Academy. My question is, how do the different Idaho ecosystems work together. 
Well, all ecosystems work together because all, there's a finite amount of, for example, carbon and nitrogen and water on the Earth. And there's constantly exchange between living organisms and the non-living world between all of the different chemicals that we need to support life. So every, no ecosystem has control of all of those molecules. And so they're constantly changing them from one form to another between living and non-living forms. And this happens across those ecosystems. As I said earlier, ecosystems don't have borders. And so they're always changing and I interacting with one another. John asks, what does inland wetland mean? An inland wetland is any ecosystem that's not next to the ocean. So you can think of a freshwater ecosystem like a river system or a lake. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I go to Jefferson Elementary. My question is, what kind of plants are in the wetland? Lots and lots. There's over hundreds of species of plants that live in wetlands. Ones that might be familiar to you might be cattails, willows, bulrushes, sedges, mosses, and some ferns. Hi, my name is Evan, and I'm from Belkin Elementary, and my question is, how do the deserts get created? Well, a desert is all about water. And if you don't get a lot of rain or a lot of snow, then it's really dry. And that's what a desert is. And we here in Idaho live in a desert. Uh, it's a very, very dry place. And so our animals and plants have adapted to learn how to live in these places. Yeah, just to add to that, a couple um, features that can add to deserts are something called the rain shadow. So we're in the rain shadow of the coastal mountains that are in Oregon and Washington. And so water falls there. You might have heard that Washington and Oregon are very, can be very rainy places. But on the east side of the mountains, it's very, very dry because the rain has already fallen in Oregon and Washington. So as they reach Idaho, usually those clouds hold much less water. And so that's one of the reasons that especially the parts of far western Idaho and northern Idaho are much drier. But as, they hit, as those same clouds hit Idaho mountains, they actually also rain. And so our mountains and our coniferous forests are supported by a little bit more rain. And then Montana gets the dry side of, um, and Wyoming get the dry side from the rain shadow of Idaho's mountains. Hey, my name is Mike. I go to Jefferson Elementary. And my question is, I know that there are different types of forests, so I'm curious if there are different types of deserts. Oh, absolutely, there are different kinds of deserts. And part of it is, again, related to a desert being about water, how much water you get. But different deserts uh, come from different parts of the world where the climate might be a little warmer and drier than others. And so some of the famous deserts that you can think of in North America are the Sonoran Desert, the Great Basin Desert. Uh, but around the world, we have the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, we have the Saharan Desert in northern Africa, and the largest deserts in the world are actually at the North Pole and the South Pole. Leif, why did you want to study about Idaho's ecosystems? Well, I'm fascinated about how our planet changes and our environment changes over time, and that's why I study the ancient history of the ecosystems in Idaho. I'm a paleontologist, so I study fossils and I study how uh, Idaho used to be underwater and part of the ocean a long time ago and then became mountains and then it became what it is today with all of its diverse modern ecosystems. And so I'm fascinated in learning about ancient animals and how they interacted with their environment, how they coped with change of how extinctions happen and how organisms recover after extinction events. Of course, this is ancient history, but it tells us a lot about what's going on today and allows us to understand by using the past to understand what our current situation is on the planet and perhaps give us a way to understand what our future might be on our planet. Ecosystems are one way we define our world. Plant communities fit within habitats that fits within ecosystems that exist within a larger area called a biome. Ecosystems can be as large as hundreds of square miles or as small as a pond.
Hi, my name is Clay and I go to White Pine Elementary School and my question is, what is an invasive plant? An invasive plant is a plant that's not native to its region, that has a tendency to spread rapidly, so it has lots of seeds and is able to live especially in disturbed habitats and usually it has to be able to, to cause some kind of economic or detrimental damage to humans or their livelihoods like agriculture. Hello, my name is Sawyer and I go to White Pine Elementary School. I have a question for you about ecosystems. How do non-native plants get here? So non-native plants get here by lots of different ways. The, probably the most common is actually through our agricultural seed. So when uh, farmers plant seeds, some of those seeds, those bags of seeds that they're putting out to plant are contaminated with weed seeds. And so because those weed seeds pretend that they are, they look like maybe a wheat seed or a millet seed or a lentil seed. And so then they grow as part of the farmer's crops. So many of our weeds are introduced through farming practices. They can also come in on vehicles. Uh, they can be stuck onto vehicles or different forms of farming equipment. And they can also just blow in. Many weed seeds have the ability to travel great distances through the, by wind. Hi, my name is Justin and I'm from White Pine Elementary and I have a question. Where are most, invas most invasive plant species located and how can we stop them from spreading? Well, some of the most invasive plant species you've probably seen before. We have thistles, we have cheatgrass, we have knapweed. These are some of the plants that are associated especially with agricultural lands, the places where we grow our food. So a couple of ways that we can control them is making sure they don't get planted in the first place. But if they do, then we can simply remove them just by pulling them out. Or we can use chemicals to kill them off. Hi, my name is Max. I, am, I go to Galileo STEM Academy and I am wondering where is the bottom of the food chain? So the bottom of the food chain is probably the most important piece of the food chain. Organisms there, mostly plants, are going to take uh, carbon that's in the air in the form of carbon dioxide and with the use of sunlight link together different carbon molecules and that forms the basis of the food chain because those molecules are the molecules that all, organ all other organisms need to survive. So that's our food. So for example it's food for plants as well as all the other animals. So plants would be the base of the food chain. Hello my name is John and I go to Galileo Sim Academy and my question today is, is the bumblebee an important part of Idaho? Yeah, there are many species of bumblebees in Idaho and they are all very important. Bumblebees are important pollinators of our flowering plants. And you might not think that that's very important, but flowering parts, plants are part of that base of the ecosystem in terms of producing the seeds and the plants that are necessary for all the other organisms in Idaho and other ecosystems as well. Hi, my name is Minjin and I'm from White Pine Elementary School. And I have a question. How do the people in Idaho negatively impact the animals around them? Well, we have to think of ourselves as being part of our ecosystem, right? And we share this ecosystem with all sorts of animals and plants. And we all take up our space and we all take up the energy in the system that's around. There's only so much energy and so much space in, that, uh, in our surroundings. And if we think about how we share those different things and places with others, then we will help reduce our negative impact on those animals and plants around us. Soil is the top layer of the earth. Without soil, our planet would be really different. So let's learn a little bit more about soil. Soil is the top layer of the earth. It's made of air and gas, bits of rock, minerals, water, decaying plants, and tiny microbes. Soil forms in different layers on the Earth. When soil scientists study layers of soil, they call it studying the soil profile. Topsoil is the layer you see, the layer you typically walk on. It contains dark organic material, which is made up of decayed plant and animal matter. Topsoil can be about six inches thick. Under topsoil is subsoil. It's from several inches to several feet thick. It looks lighter because it contains less humus is more tightly packed and has slightly bigger pieces of rock. 
Next is the fragmented rock layer, or parent material. Nothing grows at this layer. It's made of rock particles, sand, clay, salts, and minerals. At the deepest level is solid bedrock. This is the layer of rock from which soil begins to form. Soil is created over lots of time. Rocks form when volcanoes erupt or when sands get compressed. Weathering from wind, ice, and rain breaks rocks into smaller parts. Plants grow in the cracks caused by erosion, creating more holes for air and water. They also drop leaves, which decay. Animals leave waste products behind. Bacteria and fungi help break down dead plant and animal materials into smaller pieces. These combine with rock particles to make soil. Now there are different types of soil. The type depends upon the original parent material, how big the rock particles are, the climate, and what else is in the mixture. Clay is the smallest soil particle. Clay clumps because it can hold water better than some other types of soil. Silt is powdery and soft to the touch and retains water well. Sand is the largest soil particle. It is the least resistant to weathering. Loam has the best soil for growing plants. It is an even combination of sand, silt, and clay particles with organic materials. There are over 25,000 different named soils in the United States. Soil scientists are trained to be able to identify different types of soil and what they mean for the environment. Soil is very much alive. One tablespoon of soil contains more microbes than there are humans on Earth. Insects, bacteria, earthworms, and other creatures live in soil. Larger animals do too, like badgers and snakes. Soil filters are water, holding back contaminants and taking out impurities. Soil is used in construction and provides the foundation upon which our homes and businesses are built. And importantly, plants need soil to provide them with minerals and nutrients. Soil scientists help farmers understand what plants to grow and how to improve the soil to increase their crop yields. Soil is an essential natural resource. It's food for some animals, home for others. Soil cleans our water, provides nutrients for plants, and gives us a place to live. So learn about soil. Dig in. Hi, my name is Nathan from White Pine Elementary School, and I have a question. How, how does erosion affect Idaho ecosystems, and how can we restore what erosion has taken away? Well, erosion is a natural process on, on the surface of the land, but it can carve away very important things that stabilize ecosystems. We can think of soils that support the growth of all sorts of plant life and animals as getting eroded away by rainstorms and runoff. So one of the ways that we can prevent that is by making sure that vegetation and plants uh, are growing in areas and that if there a fire uh, occurs and wipes out these plants, uh, we can replace them so that the soils don't get eroded away. The other thing that we can think about is where that soil ends up. If they end up in rivers and lakes, it clouds the water and that can affect uh, organisms also. Hi, my name is Adam and I go to White Pine Elementary and my question is, what is Idaho's most useful biome for animals? So that's another really hard question because usefulness to humans might be really different from the answering the question from a plant or an animal's point of view. So if you were a plant, a most useful biome would be one that had just the right amount of sunlight, just the right amount of water, and just the right amount of nutrients in the soil. And that might vary from place to place and from plant to plant. Same from an animal's point of view. Imagine that you were a mouse. There might be certain biomes that would be best for a mouse, but maybe they wouldn't be as good for a snake or a lizard. So different biomes have different combinations of biotic and abiotic factors. And so this question really can't be answered. If you're answering it from a human's perspective, there might be biomes that are best, for example, for our agriculture, such as grasslands. And certainly we would do much better in farming in a grassland ecosystem than we would in a forest ecosystem but we wouldn't be able to get any wood to build our houses. And so if we want lumber, then a, then a forested ecosystem would be the most valuable for us. So value, it depends on what animal you're thinking about, what plant you're thinking about, or maybe the animal that you're thinking about is a human.
And then that biome really would depend on what you're planning to get out of that biome. Hi, my name is Ava and I go to Jefferson Elementary. My question is what type of plants grow in a desert? Sage. Sage loves deserts. And we also get cactus and my favorite tree, the juniper. These are all plants that are tolerant of very, very dry conditions. They can deal with uh, very warm temperatures, but they also know how to keep their moisture during the day. Valerie would like to know, how can I create an ecosystem? So actually, you might be considered an ecosystem. Your body, actually, it could be considered a complete ecosystem all to itself. You have millions and millions, if not billions, of bacteria that are living on your surface and in your, in your guts. And those would be considered part of your own little biome. Sometimes it's called a microbiome. And within that, you have living and non-living components that cycle all the time. There's water and nutrients moving around. So actually, you already have created an ecosystem by being alive. Another way, though, if you want to create an ecosystem in your classroom, maybe start with a terrarium or an aquarium. In there, you could put food and water and soils and gases, all of which would be necessary for recycling of nutrients between the different trophic levels or food levels, so between the plants and the animals and the soils. Rosemary, if someone is interested in Idaho ecosystems and wants to get a job, what should he or she study in school? They should study English and writing and communication. They should study mathematics, as much as you can. And they should study all of the natural sciences, geology, life sciences, and any kind of uh, other sciences courses that they can take, the phys physical sciences as well. But really, what you want to have is good thinking skills. So those you might learn by, for example, reading a complicated book and then learning to write about it. Or perhaps writing your own story all of these kinds of ways of thinking can be really important for developing your ability to uh, be a scientist and to study Idaho ecosystems. I'm sorry we've run out of time. I'd like to thank Rosemary and Lee for answering students' questions. You're welcome. Thanks for the questions. Our thanks also to the folks here at the Idaho Museum of Natural History at Idaho State University for hosting us. Now, if you want to learn more about Idaho ecosystems and lots of other scientific topics, you can go to the Science Trek website. We'll answer more questions about Idaho ecosystems on Science Trek, the web show. And if you want to submit a question for Science Trek, it's easy. And you and your class can win prizes. You can send it as an email or as a video question, recorded on your webcam or cell phone. And if you're an educator, we'll even lend you a camera. Our last prize winner was Marquis in Ms. DeWitt's class at Wilder Middle School. So to find out all about Idaho's ecosystems, how to send in your questions, and how to win, go to the Science Trek website. And each week, check out my blog for the latest science news for kids. You'll find it all at idahoptv.org slash science trek. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Science Trek. Presentation of Science Trek on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. If you want to learn more about this topic or watch our videos, check out the Science Trek website at idahoptv.org slash science trek.